Village Labs Rick Library, and I'm just going to quickly give you a welcome and thank you so much for coming. We are really excited to have in-person events again because we have this space and we couldn't use it for a while, and we were very sad about that. So thank you so much for coming, and I'm going to turn it over to Shane Mullen. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to avoid the camera. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. This is Luck Big Books in St. Louis uh, Public Library, Schlafly Branch. Welcome baseball historian Bob Tina and broadcast journalist Ron Jacober, who will discuss one of the most exciting seasons in Cardinal baseball history, 64 Cardinals. Tonight's event is possible because of your support. When you support Luck Big Books, your money goes directly into the local economy. It helps keep our bookstore open, and it also helps keep your streets paved, your libraries funded, your parks free, and so many other things, making St. Louis a better place. So I would like to thank you all for the local and for supporting this event. For the virtual audience, hello, people watching virtually. You can interact with the event by typing in questions as a comment, and you will also be able to ask questions at the end of the event. For the people watching in person, you will have the opportunity to ask questions at the end of the event as well. I am Shane Mullen. I'm the events coordinator for Left Bank Books. I help produce our hundreds of author events each year with the fantastic team here in St. Louis, who is joining me this evening. We are very happy to be able to be bringing you in-person events again. It is such a thrill to see faces actually in person. I've produced over 250 virtual events, and it's really nice to be back in person. Uh, be sure to check out our event calendar for more in-person events. On May 3rd, we will be back, back here at the Schlafly Branch of the Library for Wade Rouse for his memoir, Magic Season, A Son's Story. Wade grew up in southern Missouri and wrote a memoir about connecting with his father over a shared love of Cardinals baseball. But now, about tonight's book. In one of the most exciting seasons in baseball history, the 1964 St. Louis Cardinals surged in the final months to steal the pennant and stop the mighty Yankees in seven games to capture the World Series. How did an unlikely assortment of people and events come together for such a monumental achievement? Look no further than 64 Cardinals, a photo-illustrated story of promise, turmoil, and triumph. Discover how the famous trade for Luke Rock provided a jolt that reversed a summer swing. Witness superstar pitcher Bob Gibson ascend to dominance down the stretch and meet the other indispensables. Her flood, Dick Grote, Bill White, and many others. Uh, I will let them tell you more about uh, the rest of the season, so I'll leave the suspense. But uh, this is an exhilarating ride for any baseball fan. 64 Cardinals also heralds the return of the writing team of baseball historian Bob Tiemann and broadcast journalist Ron Jacober, who co-authored the local bestseller Immortal Moments in Cardinal History, which we also have available for sale tonight. Whether you watched the 64 Cardinals in person or have just heard the stories passed down over the years, this book is the capstone on any baseball lover's collection. So now, on behalf of Love Bank Books, the St. Louis Public Library, and Reading Press, would you help me in warmly welcoming our guests for this evening. And thank you all for coming, as I said before. Can you um, fix this mic? Can you hear how it sounds? It's really yeah. distorted. Yeah. Yeah. Do we, do we have any need it? Okay. How's that? Does it seem like Sounds okay? Sounds better. Better? Okay. All right. Well, as, it, as he said, it's profusely illustrated, and all the pictures we'll show you on the screen tonight are actually in the book. So, um, um, the Cardinals. The 1964 team was probably the most unexpected of all the Cardinal championships. Um, yeah. You need for each other. Next slide. You can, uh, there's a graph in the appendix. Here, as you see, the Cardinals in red, they were only in first place the only time all season for the last week of the season. 
way, if any of you can explain that to me, I'd appreciate it. When you go up, you lose your down. It's easy. And it's the end of the season, the team that most wins wins. Um, the, the, we'll tell you how the, how the team was built and examine many of the unique personalities that were on and around it. Um, the, uh, it was a remarkably um, harmonious team in a time of racial turmoil in the country, and um, that, we'll go into that as well. The uh, so book begins with the purchase of the team in 1953 by Anheuser Bush. Early President Otis A. Bush Jr. became the president of the Ball Club. Um, Bush was a dynamic and successful uh, brewer and business owner and civic leader, and uh, 1964 was a very big year for Gussie. Not only did AB become the first brewer in history to brew and sell over 10 million barrels of beer in one year, August served as the chairman of the organization that staged hundreds of commemorations, reenactments, and other events highlighting the St. Louis by St. Daniel in 1963. Only a big, big team certainly did not hurt Gussie's beer business. Old Sportsman's Park was purchased in 53 and renamed Bush Stadium and given a new scoreboard with a neon Budweiser sign. Unfortunately, Gussie knew very little about the business of baseball. Um, through the 50s, Stan Musi was the revered face of the Cardinal franchise. This is him at Union Station, coming back from Chicago today and got his 3,000th hit. But as Stan's skills faded, the Cardinals remained also ran. And after a decade without winning a pennant, the owner was becoming increasingly um, frustrated with the team. So in 1957, he hired St. Louis and Bing Devine as the general manager. Bing had started way with the team way back in 1939 as an office for life and worked his way up through the minor league system as an executive. Bing uh, built his team around, initially around Ken Boyd, the third baseman, who had been with the team since 55. In 58, he brought in center fielder Kurt Flood there at the top. Next year, 59, he inquired Bill White to play first base. 1960, Julian Javier was brought into the station at second base. And then in 1963, he traded for Dick Grote for at shortstop. And also in 63, Tim McCarver became the starting catcher for the first time after several minor, after several cups of coffee in earlier years. The Carter pitching staff. Um, was anchored by the, their starters, Bob Gibson, um, Kurt Simmons and Ray Sadecki, and Ernie Brogio. Um, they were, they did, they had some problems in 63, but come on strong light. Um, the veteran minor league manager, Johnny Keane, had been hired to lead the big league club in 1961. He was generally mild there and soft spoken man, although he could be rough with his players when he needed to. And he'd already mentored several of the younger Cardinals. The core of the team was their all star infield. Boyer at second, Boyer at third, uh, Rock at short, Javier at second base, and White at first. All three have been National League starters in the all star game in 1963. And in both 63 and 64, all four of them played over 150 of the 162 games scheduled. So they were also, they were Ironman as well as All Stars. Now, late 63, the Cardinals went on a tear, winning 19 out of 20 games over a course of just 17 days to pull themselves within one game of first place. Unfortunately, Kurt Simmons was the star, one of the stars in that. Run and he had three straight shutouts at one point. But unfortunately, the Dodgers came to town and swept the three game series led by Sammy Koufax, their superstar pitcher. Koufax shut the Cardinals out in that series. The next year, he shut the Cardinals out at Dodger Stadium three different times. 
Okay. The second place finish in 63 was the Cardinals' best since 1949. Oh, and things were out there was optimism during the spring training here in 1964. Now, you see Stan Musil there in the back. He was working out with the team in 64 because he'd been appointed the president's advisor on physical fitness. And so, what, what better excuse for physical fitness than jumping jacks with the ball club? Um, but the Cardinals, after a um, poor start, um, had a slump there. After a fair start, they had a slump there in May and June. And by the training deadline, they were in eighth place, below 500. Now, Ben Vaughn knew that they needed more offense from the outfielders, so he made one last deal. At the trading deadline, he sent former 20 game winner Earl Brother over to the Cubs for underachieving outfielder Lou Brock. And at the end of the season in 64, with the Cubs, Brock had a 251 average. But um, over, just over 100 games with the Cardinals, he had 348, almost a 100 point improvement. And while the Cubs ownership of division Brock as a power hitter, Cardinal manager Johnny Keene turned him to free about home runs. And concentrate on bases and solid bases. He did, of course, and the deal, the deal was the key to the championship. Brock's speed and determination quickly won over his new teammates and the St. Louis fans, and his Hall of Fame career quickly took off. Now, the Cardinals uh, were still under 500 after the All Star break, was an inconsistent offense and weak hitting. Ken Boyer, who actually was a pretty good fielder, um, was one of the few hitters to come up to snuff in the first half, as was Kurt Flood in center field. But um, among the biggest underachievers was Bill White, who the year before had over 100 RBIs, but at the All Star break in 64, only had 30, although he finished with 704 for the season. So 30 in the first half, 100, or 57, or 72. Um, that's not money. Um, in the second half, there's the book has an appendix listing players' first half and second half statistics, if you're interested in that. Okay. Um, pitcher Ray Sinecki was pitching well throughout the season. He won 20 games that year by winning four games in May, four games in June, four games in July, four games in August, and four games in September. That's very consistent. And from his first and only 21 seasons, Bob Gibson only won 19, but he would have 21 seasons later. Um, he was the club's first best pitcher in the first half, but his win loss rate didn't reflect it, mostly because of poor run support. Now, Gibby he had his pitching slump late in July, but down the stretch he came on very strong, and really for the first time established himself as one of the premier pitchers in baseball. While the focus of this book is the games on the field, we also take some time to look at the wider social picture. Um, Ron will go deeper into the Black Bay's travails and segregated South and the close interrelation, interracial relationships that grew up on the team. There are also a few stories about the players, yeah, how the players had fun away from the park. Bob Uri and Tim O'Carr were shown here when they joined themselves. But uh, roommates at the Bel Air Motel, which now is the, the Holiday Inn Express right across the street from here. Um, for much of the winter and for much of the summer, Yuga is reported, or McCarver reports that Yuga was eerily serious in the room and he loved to sit by the pool and work on his tan. Um, both of these guys were natural comics and they kept the players loose. Yuga, especially with his imitations of um, Harry Carey on the bus. Harry sitting in the front of the bus was not humored, however. <laughs> McCarver and Sinecki were also uh, good, also did comic skits. They're crazy Guggenheim uh, invitation you may remember if you were old enough. It was thought to be quite good. Now, the bachelor players generally stayed in hotels while the, the home, the, the out of town players with families would rent a house during the summer months. But they also would stay in hotels during the school year, school months. Rosini's, oh, well, I'm not, I'm not. Rosini's uh, 
that's a good point. Yeah, we are on. Okay, that's on. Um, you may remember other Rowling Place on Salem, um, Nantucket Cove, um, Kings Highway, and of course, Stan Museum and Bingham's on Oakland. We're all favorite hangouts for the ball players. Okay, now, in the second half of the season, um, we provided two call ups from the minor leagues that were also key moves. One was Mike Shannon came up with the All Star break and took over in right field. That gave the Cardinals a, a set eight man lineup that they didn't change for the rest of the year, really. And then Barney Schultz came up on August 1st. Barney had spent nearly two decades in the minors already, or mostly in the minors. He had a few cups, a few um, stints in the majors. But he was back in the minors until August 1st, 1964. And after he came up, he gave the Cardinals the word bench stoppers that they'd so sorely needed for most of the season. Okay. Now, the, the, the team climbed over to 500 claim votes in July and August, but by mid August, um, Bush had had enough. The team was apparently out, hopelessly out of the pennant. And so he summarily fired Ben Devine, much to Devine's surprise. And it also became an open secret um, that uh, he was going to fire Keen at the end of the season and bring in Leo DeRosa as manager. Um, now, the Cardinals, you were at, when they with 39 games to play, were 11 games out. That's a, Dem said that no other team had ever um, overcome in one event. But um, so they kept plugging away, and we kept sounding the final two weeks of the season. The Phillies suddenly went insurmountable the league, then they lose three in a row to the Reds, four in a row to the Braves down there at the bottom, and then three in a row to the Cardinals. So now suddenly, the last weekend of the season, the Cardinals are in first place by half a game. All they have to do is win, swing three games from the last place match. Well, the Cardinals lost a one nothing heartbreaker on Friday. They were embarrassed 15 to 5 on Saturday. And on the final morning of the season, there was still a possibility of a three way tie. But uh, the Phillies beat the Reds, they knocked them out, while the Cardinals finally beat the Reds. 11 to 5, and the uh, pen at the last out of the season at Bush Stadium was when the last out was made at Bush Stadium. Harry Carey crowed over the radio, the Cardinals win the pennant, the Cardinals win the pennant, the Cardinals win the pennant. Over and over he went. Um, there was a man dash to the clubhouse and um, a beautiful celebration in the Cardinal clubhouse. But it wasn't Custom Bush to play, this is the happiest moment of my live long life. This World Series will be returning to St. Louis for the first time in 18 years, and in the bicentennial year, no less. Okay. The Cardinals' opponents in the World Series, they, in the 18 years the Cardinals have been out of the World Series, they've been in it 16 of the, or 15 of the 18. 14, out of, and this was their fifth in a row. They were headed by Mickey Mantle, who had his last few years as a hitter, although he was hobbled on defense for the last part of the season with bad knees and a right uh, sort of throwing shoulder, something that the Cardinals exploited to a great effect during the series. <clears throat> Game one of the series uh, was won by the Cardinals 9 to 5 with Mike Shannon, the rookie, or the rest of the rookie, really, but. Young Mike Shannon in the marathon run off of Hall of Famer Whitey Ford. The Yankees bounced back to win both games two and three. Game three, they won with the walk off homer by Mickey Mantle off of Barney Schultz. So you can see Mantle coming home with the third base coach right behind him, while Schultz, number 33, is walking dejectedly to the clubhouse. Um, Game four, the Cardinals rallied to win four to three with Ken Boyer hitting a grand slam home run in the sixth inning. This is the game of the series that I got to attend, my very first World Series game. Roger Craigman 
Ron Taylor a pitch eight shot out innings of relief for the Cardinals to give them the win. Game five was another epic Cardinal victory. This one five to three in ten innings. Gibson pitched the whole game, went the distance, and his battery with Tim McCarver um, provided the winning margin with a three run home run in the tap. You can see that Kimber was pretty happy with his uh, catcher that day. Okay. Now, after the Yankees bounced back to the series eight to three in game six, game seven would feature the third matchup of the series between Bell Stoudemire and the Mets, or the Mets, the Yankees, and Bob Gibson. Stoudemire was knocked out of the game early, and the Cardinals built up a six nothing lead. But Gibson was getting tired himself. Um, he gave up three Yankee home runs to cut the lead to nine to, to seven to five in the ninth inning. And when Johnny King was asked later why he didn't take Gibson out when he was obviously losing it, his reply was, quote, I, have, I was committed to him. He has a great heart, unquote. Well, when Gibson finally got the final out, he collapsed in exhaustion into the arms of the Cardinals' main man, Ken Boyer. There was another wild celebration in the clubhouse. Here we've got Grote and Gibson, who were bridge players out here on the road in the clubhouse. Bridge partners. Um, there's, here we are sharing the, the joy and the champagne and the love. So what a, what a way to end the season. Well, then the next day, baseball got a huge shot. First, the Yankees fired the first new manager Yogi Berra, even though he won the pennant. Meanwhile, St. Louis, Gussie Bush called the press conference intending to announce a new contract for Johnny King. Instead, Johnny King handed his letter of resignation to a stunned Bush. And all they could do was swallow their pride. Then, less than a week later, Johnny King signed, signed, signed the manager to the Yankees. So, what a turnaround. So these, um, well, this postseason shots have, have lost their value, have lost their uh, cachet over the years. The unlikely side of the 64 Cardinals continues to resonate in baseball history. Thank you. The players on that team, you just think, one, two, three, four, <laughs> might be better off. <laughs> you don't even need that one. <laughs> don't give me that one, Bob. I'm too, I'm too. The, uh, yeah, see what that picture turned out on. The players uh, on that 64 team were magnificent players, I think, and really, um, for the reason, Farther away was better. Okay. You might your voice. I don't think you need it. I probably don't need it. I was going to say, you might not even need it, but you can try to turn it down and see if that helps. The thing that turned that season around, as Bob mentioned, on June the 15th, the trading deadline, when the Cardinals. we got a week our guy up in the back. Oh my God, it's a club uniform. <laughs> Well, that helped the Cardinals win the World Series, that club uniform. It was Lou Brock, of course, as uh, Bob said, acquiring that trade on June the 15th of the life of Earlio. Now, ESPN says, and I saw this recently, it was the worst in-season trade in the history of the major leagues. Lou Brock for Ernie Earlio. I had a friend in Chicago who called and said, oh my God, we got you this time. Earlio was a 28th winner one time. He was 17, won 17 games in the season before for the Cardinals, and they traded this kid, Brock, who they weren't sure he could play. But as Bob said, he uh, they wanted him to be a power hitter. He did have prodigious power at a time, but he didn't do it consistently. And let's listen to a little audio here from Lou Brock if we can. Apparently, we're not going to get it, I guess. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
Said that, you know, when the Cardinals got him, Johnny Keene said, we don't care if he hit all runs, we want you to get on the base and run. And that's what he did. Got to know Lou pretty well over the years. Did two television specials with him while he was still with the team. And I remember one time I wanted to do something. And about noon, the only time I get a camera, it was, it was a game day. I'll come down, he said. So we, we walked between first and second base as he was describing how he sold bases, how he read the pictures. He was a math major in college so he, he had that kind of a that kind of a mind. The thing about Brock the thing about Brock uh, is that he uh, okay the thing about Brock was that he was able to read pitch outs, read pitchers. And I remember he told me one time that he can read a pitch out. You know what a pitch out is a catcher Expects a stolen base, so he jumps out, catches the ball outside. Brock said, I can read a pitch out. Gibson said, The hell you can. Brock said, Yes, I can. So that's the way he played the game. <laughs> and Lou was, was really a neat guy. He didn't know much about baseball. He grew up in Mississippi, a very poor family, of course. And he didn't know anything about baseball until he was like 12 years old. He happened to go past a park. It's all literally a game. He said, yeah, that, that looks like it might be fun. He decided he might, might try to want to play baseball. So he goes from that 12-year-old to one of the greatest players in the history of the game. Got to know him real well. Tim McCarter was, uh, was a key to this team. He was a 22-year-old catcher. And Timmy told me, he said, I called and caught every pitch that Bob Gibson threw in three World Series. But the key to McCarter, and I asked him about this, where, and Bob mentioned it, he had the three-run home in the 10th inning off the Yankees to win game five. I think we have some audio there, too. No, we don't want to go there. It's there. Well, that's all right. No, no, he's going to get it. You got it? Get the first There you go. Three balls, two strikes. On to three is there. It's a three and two situation. Mickelson is thrown. That big change of pace curve. Three balls, two strikes. He's doing a national broadcast, so he couldn't go crazy. You know, he said way back, you know, it might be, could be a home run, but he didn't do his normal thing. Now, I asked McCarver about this particular situation, and he said, in my mind's eye, that they, the Yankees have moved Mantle to right field from center field, but Maris in center field because Mantle's knees were really bad and didn't throw very well. And he said, in my mind's eye, I can see Mantle going back to the wall the ball flying over his head into the stands. He said, the single most important ep episode or incident in my lifetime. That's how we remember as a 22-year-old guy. He, it was something he will take to the grave with him. Third baseman was Kenny Boyer, as Bob mentioned. A Boyer hit the, hit the grand slam in game four to win the game. And Boyer had not done much. And I'll explain to you, listen to Harry Carey's call of this. Thank you. 
Now, I know there's something there. Harry's a long time dude. Harry and Roy didn't get along very well. For whatever reason, they didn't mix very well at all. And that was just a slight little stick of, of criticism, I think, by Harry uh, because of the way he and Roy got along. I'm going to play a, a role in this World Series because he didn't play. Uh, Luca was a good defensive catcher, but he couldn't really. I think that's 64 season. He had 22 hits and 23 strikeouts. And uh, but he was a pretty good defensive catcher. But he he jokes that he said, I did the Cardinals a favor before the World Series. They asked me to take a shot of hepatitis so that they could disable me <laughs> and put Val Maxwell on the roster. <laughs> but funny story, and this is actually a true story. If you go to the next one, there was a marching band on the field. And Bob Euchre took the tuba and started catching fly balls in the tuba. And he said, somebody said, I didn't catch them all clean. Cost me $300 to fix that tuba because they kind of it kind of all it up. But it's a true story. He actually took the tuba and tried to catch fly balls in it. But the key to the season and the, the Cardinals in that era was Bob Gibson. Gibby was a phenomenal rate in the season. He started earlier on, but he was pitching on short rest because in game, in the last game of the uh, National League pennant, where they had to beat the Mets on Sunday, he came in and pitched a couple of innings of relief because they had to win the game. So he couldn't start game one of the World Series. So he only was able to pitch or win two games in that series. But Gibby was a, was a phenomenal pitcher, best pitcher in Cardinal history. I got to know him really well because he did a post game show with me on Cam Wax after Cardinal Baseball for a couple of years. And he describes things to me that off the air were a lot more interesting than on the air. But he talks about the problem that the black players had in those days. And he said when he arrived in spring training as a rookie, he flew to St. Petersburg, to Tampa really, and the cab driver took him to the team hotel. He walked into the team hotel and the best car said, you can't stay here. And he told the cabbie where to take him to the quote, Negro side of town. The black players were put up in a rooming house on the east side of of, of uh, St. Petersburg. He said the second year he noticed that, that some, a lot of the players brought their families this spring training. So he said, I thought I would do that too. He lived in Omaha. He said, they lived in Omaha, lived there most of his life when he wasn't playing baseball. He said, it was the worst drive you can imagine from Omaha to St. Petersburg because he said, we could buy gas everywhere. We couldn't use restrooms. He'd stop at a, at a gas station, but you couldn't use the restroom. And they would have to drive to the Negro side, as he described to the town, to find a place to eat and to find a place to stay. It was not unusual in those days. Now, you know, people say, oh, that was a long time ago. Well, yeah, but it was in my lifetime that, that they were treated that way. Um, but Gibson was very outspoken about it. He wrote a book uh, called, his first book was uh, from Kevin McClory. Yeah, Kevin McClory, where it was a pretty tough book to read because he got into all that. Uh, but I got to know him really well. He's, you know, he, he could be surly. Uh, he would intimidate media people. Uh, his own teammates didn't talk to him the day he was going to pitch. The media better not talk to him the day before he was going to start. He was that tough. He was that tough. But I later on in life, I said, you know, you were really mellow. No, I haven't. He said, well, give, give me your signing autographs, for God's sakes. He wouldn't do that when you, when you were playing. But what a terrific band, a terrific uh, pitcher. And I fought too young recently. Of course, he, he struggled for about a year with that. First baseman was Bill Wright, and Bill Wright tells a similar story. In St. Petersburg, uh, they would, uh, the Chamber of Commerce would do a thing in the spring all the time, uh, saluting baseball, because the Cardinals and the Yankees were training in St. Petersburg. So Bill Wright uh, said that what happened was, they would have this big luncheon, but they wouldn't only invite the white players. The black players were not invited to this lunch. And he made mention of the two local writers, of the sports writers, who wrote the story on a political Democrat. And White said, why don't they go start treating us like human beings? And uh, it was in the, in the club, and, and the club suggested that people boycott Budweiser because of it. I don't know what Gussie Bush's feelings about race were, but he was complacent with this because he didn't protest the fact that they only invited the white players to the sling. So he knew he had a problem. 
So we talked to a friend in the Bottingham Hotel in St. Petersburg, a big motel, so all the players could stay together, the black players and the white players. Even Stan Mitchell and Kenny Boyer had their own places down there that they were staying for training. But uh, they moved into the motel with their families too, so they were all there together. And Wright told me that we were probably the most integrated team in baseball because of that. They got a long run, the wives barbecued outside. But Wright said one of the most amazing things was the fact that uh, people would drive past the motel because this is the deep south. They would see something they had never seen before. Black kids and white kids in the same swimming pool. So that was the racial aspect back then, and the players had to put up with it as, best, as much as they could. But, you know, as I said, people say, oh, it was a lifetime ago. A long time ago, yeah, it was. But uh, it was still in our lifetime. Mike Shannon was called up in mid-season. You were right when he said he was a rookie. He was called, he went to Missouri on a football scholarship. I don't know if you knew that or not. He was a great football player at CBC High School. He was a quarterback. And went to Missouri on a football scholarship. But he also played baseball, obviously. Cardinals offered him a bonus in those days. So he left Missouri after a year to play pro baseball. And they called him up in the middle of the season when they weren't doing it that well. He put him in right field, strong arm guy, he could really throw. Well, in game one of the World Series, he hit a home run off Whitey Ford. The game one, by the way, was at Sportsman's Market here in St. Louis, because in those days, they alternated between the National League and the American League. It didn't matter who had the best record. So the Cardinals were going to have a really home field advantage if you, if you call it that in seven games. So he hits a home run in game one, and they won the game. And he described it to me. He said, and this is the thing that I was amazed with, how little of the minutia they, those guys remember from 50-some years ago. He said, right before through, he took curveballs inside and then hung one. And it was a moon shot. We've got the audio of that home run, I do believe, with Mike Shannon. Shannon described it to me. He said they two two curveballs inside and then hung one. At the old sportsman's park, which was later changed to Bush Stadium when they really brought the team, there was a left field bleachers, and behind the bleachers was a big manual scoreboard. I mean, it's a big one, but it's a manual scoreboard. Above the manual scoreboard was what we believe is the first neon sign in baseball. It's a big Budweiser sign. And Shannon's home run knocked out the U in that Budweiser sign. I said, how far was that gone, Mike? He said, I don't know, but it was a long way. Well, the next day he shows up at the ballpark, and a guy was standing by the owner's box called him over, Mike, come over here, and handed Mike a bill for $400 <laughs> to repair the Budweiser sign. Well, he said, then the guy laughed. He said, no, I'm not going to charge you. I'll give it to Gussie. So he gave it to Bush. Bush said, I don't care. It's tell off. Take the whole damn thing down if you want. But uh, he said, well, the guy handed me that bill for 400 bucks. In those days, that was a lot of money, of course. But Shannon played a big role for many years. Unfortunately, Mike is not very well right now, as you probably will. He got COVID a year ago in spring training, and he's really struggled. We heard him late last season. It was really hard to... Hard to listen to him, but the Cardinals couldn't say no in his 50th year. So, but Mike was a good ball player. Finally, the Yankees were managed by a guy from South St. Louis named Yogi Berra. Yogi was a real character. His team, the Yankees, won 99 games that season. So it, it was a shock that they would fire him after one season, even though they lost to the Cardinals in the World Series. Uh, but uh, Yogi used to come back two or three times a year to South St. Louis, and all the neighborhood kids called him Yogi, Uncle Yogi. He was Yogi to everybody. Lawrence was his real given name, but um, Yogi was a funny guy because of his, of his expressions, Yogiisms, battle props, as they, as they call him. Like, that restaurant is so busy, nobody goes there anymore. 
because it's never black. But he told things like that, and I, I suspect a lot of it was on purpose, to tell you the truth. He was a, he was a great player. Yogi was uh, like 5'8", I guess, fire plug kind of guy. His parents were immigrants from Italy. They knew nothing about baseball, nothing about baseball. And uh, he quit school after the eighth grade. He said, the only thing I liked in school was recess. And he got part-time jobs so he could play baseball. In those days, he could get away with doing that, I guess. He and, and Graggiola, Joe Graggiola, lived right across the street from him. And uh, they had a tryout. And the Yankees offered Graggiola 500 bucks to sign. They offered Yogi 250. Yogi was ticked off because, because they offered Graggiola twice what they offered him. So he turned them down. Uh, Graggiola did sign with the Cardinals for the 500. The Yankees came along and gave Yogi the 500. Well, it turns out, he, some people think he was the greatest catcher in the history of the game. He had so many World Series rings. He, he caught, I forget how many thousands, maybe 30,000 innings, some ridiculous amount of, of innings. But a great player, great catcher. Some people didn't understand it because of the way he talked. But uh, I don't know if he had been a good manager or not, to tell you the truth. He then tried to manage some next, didn't he, over on the with the World Series with the Mets. With the World Series with the Mets. But uh, one final comment about, about that, uh, and this is off the, not in the book, but years ago, I was telling a couple of guys, the Cubs used to have these old time escapes where they would bring back a lot of players and they would recreate, they recreated the 46 World Series with the Red Sox. But anyway, they had Yogi back in, in, and uh, Yogi Berra and Casey Stengel. And I got Yogi and Casey on the same sofa for this interview on Channel 5. Neither one of them what the other one was talking about. It was so funny. And I don't know how many times uh, Channel 5 used that. One other story I meant to tell you about Gibson. Gibby had, uh, was very ill as a youngster. He had pneumonia and he had rickets. When he went to high school, he was 4 foot 10 inches tall and with 80 pounds when he was a freshman in high school. Well, he had a growth spurt, obviously. He became a very good basketball player, but he couldn't play on the white teams in Omaha. He had to play on the black teams in Omaha. He really wanted to play college baseball, or college basketball, excuse me. He played baseball in high school, too. But basketball was his favorite sport. And uh, the coach at, at his high school tried to find a school that would give him a basketball scholarship because he was pretty good. They thought Indiana University was going to. And after reading a lot of time, they got a letter from the coach at Indiana University saying, we have our, we have our quota of Negroes on the team, and one. And on the clear blue sky, late in his freshman and his senior year, Creighton University in Omaha offered him a basketball scholarship. So he, he turned out he was the only black player on the team, but he was the best player on the team. And he wanted to play for the Globetrotters for a year. Uh, because the Cardinals did sign him to a minor league contract, but he wasn't making very much money. So because he loved basketball so much, the Trotters hired him for one season in the wintertime. And Big Levine finally said, you know, we'll pay you enough money so you don't have to play basketball and get hurt in the wintertime. And, but that was his basketball story. But the fact that he was 4 foot 10, 80 pounds when he went to high school, this guy grew up to be one of the greatest bulls in, in baseball history, one of the greatest arms in the game. So that kind of, kind of covers the players. Uh, I guess if you want to ask some questions, is that where we go now? Thank you. Uh, sorry about the little confusion with the video. This is the first time we've done that this year, so it's kind of a rehearsal, I get more than anything else. Any questions for Brown Red? Yeah. Where, where did um, the, the Johnny Keene, uh, how did he place Sadecki and Gibson in terms of one and two? Sadecki won 20 games that year, right? Yeah, but Gibson got hurt. But, but um, by, Gibson was definitely the number one. Um, yeah, had better ERA. Uh, was, you know, he was the one that the, teams, the other teams didn't want to face. Okay. He, he had a little lack of run support. Probably kept him from 20 wins. Uh, um, Eddie Stanky managed the Cardinals before that and didn't like Gibson. In fact, a lot of people thought Stanky. I mean, Stanky was, excuse me, Stanky was, was, was kind of a racist and he, he tried to, he, he didn't like Gibson, let me put it that way. And so that hurt his development early on. But as soon as King took over, he said, you're my guy, you're my guy. 
So just relax and get out there and pitch, and that's what he did. Were there uh, ten teams in each league? Ten teams in each league. You win the planet, there were no playoffs. You win the planet, you go to the World Series. And the Cardinals were in eighth place at one time during during that season. When, when Brock trade was made. Uh, the Brock trade was made, they were in eighth place, yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, I do so. No. You also start playing the World Series like three days yeah. after the season. The season ends on Sunday and World Series starts on Wednesday. Yeah. yeah. Well, it always was. I guess that was hard to keep the other nine teams involved, uh, like uh, fans. Uh, That's why they started the playoffs, yeah. to tell you the truth, because it creates a lot of interest in September by the teams that might have a chance, that might have a chance. And those are, but that, as Bob said, it came down from last weekend. It could have been a three-way tie for the pennant in the last weekend, that weekend, that last weekend. The Phillies totally collapsed, and that's why the Cardinals had a chance to win it. They totally collapsed. It looked like Philadelphia was going to win. The Cardinal players I read were hoping they played well enough to get second place in the National League because the second place money was, was you know, something they, they would like. How much was it? Oh, it was like between one and two thousand. Yeah, one or two thousand players to finish second. I don't know what the World Series. Well, eighty eight hundred. Eighty eight hundred. Okay. Okay. The winner's share. The winner's share was eighty eight hundred. Yeah. Now you couldn't. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Did Musial ever, Stan Musial ever, ever uh, express any regrets that he stayed on another year? Even then, Musial's comment was. Yeah, well, I wouldn't, that wouldn't win the World Series with me. They wouldn't have gotten right. <laughs> you know, they wouldn't have gotten right. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. But it was Sam became general manager for a while, yeah. a couple of seasons later, but he didn't like that at all. He didn't like that front of office work and things like that. But uh, what, a, what a great human being Stan Musial was. I mean, uh, I was around Stan a lot. I never, ever saw him rude to anybody. Never saw him rude to anybody. I don't know they always listen, but he signed everything. That's why the musical stuff, remember, really is not worth all that much. The Stan signed everything. He used to carry around kind of a baseball card he had made with his signature on it. Just hand them out, you know. He's kind of an interest in signing, too. Yeah. Sign with you well, in those days, the clubhouse guys signed most of the stuff. To tell you the truth. They, they, they got to learn the signature of the players, and they, and they signed. They, they only got a bunch of it. It's hard to tell the difference. <clears throat> well, uh, first, a, a little aside, in Cleveland, Bob Feller was the same way. One time I was at a memorabilia auction in Cleveland, and the guy announced, we have here an extremely rare unsigned photograph of Bob Feller. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the West Branch Ricky always intrigues me about the whole 1964 thing, because yeah. to me, I mean, he's this wonderful hero inventing, basically inventing the large-scale uh, farm system, and then, of course, Jackie Robinson and so forth. Yeah. And in 64, he just comes across as a complete jerk. Well, but now, was, am I sort of too black and white on that, or I, well, comment was, on that? Um, he, uh, well, when he was assigned as a consultant right. the, at the first press conference, a big divine, the general manager was there, and divine walked out on the press conference. He was being ignored by the press. Yeah. Um, and then they were driving somewhere, and Divine Ricky said, "Well, do we will we have any trouble if I come in to run the team?" And Divine said, "We're not gonna we're not gonna have trouble. We've got trouble now." So there was a lot of tension. So he really did know. So we, we think that he he was the one that's total gusting the fire, the big Divine, uh, as general manager in the middle of the season, and he so. Uh, Ricky brought in or recommended they hire a guy named Bob Hansen as the general manager who was a minor league guy. And all Hansen did was write memos about how the players should wear their socks, where they should stand on the, on the left deck circle, things like that. Players hated him because he never went down and see him. And he took credit. And this is the thing, he's absolutely won the World Series. Hansen took credit for my team winning. And so the players said, the hell you did. You didn't win it. And didn't the didn't the players vote to uh, divide a World Series share or what was it? I, I think they gave him a ring. I think that was it. That was it. They gave him a ring. Yeah, they gave him rings a lot of people. I've got one from eighty two. So. <laughs> you mentioned this is a little 
off, but it's certainly on the 64 season. The collapse of the Phillies is what it's famous for. Right. But I have only in books learned that the Phillies collapsed because Gene Mock had two pitchers. He had other pitchers. He used he two using, pitchers. Right. Was Chris good. Short and Jim Bunning, I'm guessing, but I don't know. Yeah, those were the two that... And it, sure. it reminds me as much as I'm not a fan of Tungo Lusa, I've never known a manager that has a better understanding of 162 games, which your chart really points to. Every game in April that you win counts as a win. Right. Every game in May counts as a win. And Lewis is there at the end of the season, wherever he is. <laughs> well, I got to know him, and he was one of me on Sunday mornings. I can't wait for like 10 years. So it was. Uh, so it was the guy that he followed. Um, and there were two, I'm talking about Whitey, and there were two totally different managers. They were both very good managers, but their personalities were just polar opposite from the other one. You know, Whitey liked to joke around. He held court in his office all the time, especially for the national writers, where Tony was strictly business all the time. I told him one time, I said, Tony, you got to smile more. <laughs> You, you're in the dugout, there's never really a lot of it. Yeah, that's what my wife tells me, too, she said. <laughs> but, uh, he, they're both very good managers, but you're right. Tony was... Uh, players told me he was three or four years ahead of everybody else. In terms of what might happen. I think he was three or four sure. months ahead. I remember that. I, I, yeah. I marvel. In the game, you can criticize him right and left. In October, there he is. Yeah. If I could get back to the Bing Divine and Branch Ricky issue and ask one more question. If you know this, what was, what was their, before uh, Bush hired Branch Ricky, what was their relationship, Bing Divine and well, Branch Ricky? I mean, Bing Divine has been the Cardinal general manager, vice president general manager, when Divine got his first job out of school as an office boy for the Cardinals, 1939. So he, you know, that's Divine always. Felt that Ricky thought he was still an office boy. So did Branch Ricky hire Bing Divine? No, no. Um, Somebody. Well, he hired Ricky. He hired. Well, I'm, I'm not sure if he hired him as the office boy, but he didn't hire him as the general manager. Right, right, right. But Branch Ricky was the general manager of the Cardinals in the late '30s. No, no, he was the office boy in the Cardinals. Uh, no, well, Ricky, Ricky was, was the manager. Yes. He was the general manager, and then did he hire Divine as the office boy? Um, it could have been. It could have been actually Bill Dewitt that hired him as the office oh, boy. Yeah, I, I, sure I would think that Ricky would have hired the office boy. Yeah. Okay. But, he, but the, the, the theory was that Ricky always looked at Bing Devon as the office boy. I see. <coughs> I see. Okay. Thank so you. So their relationship was not good at all. And I think they knew when they brought in Ricky as a consultant, <coughs> he was in trouble. But it, it just wasn't going to work. And, you know, he came back later as the Cardinals general manager a yeah. few, few years later. Uh, he turned down an offer with the Mets for part ownership of the Mets. Not at a small percentage, but it would be worth millions. And he turned it down to come back to, to St. Louis. And, Anything else? And when did Johnny Keene, do you think, know he was going to work for the Yankees? Or was Johnny Keene's plan just, I'm not going to work for the Cardinals? Yeah, he, in September, he wrote a letter, wrote a letter of resignation in the middle of September. He knew he, he was going to quit after the season, not knowing they were going to win the World Series. But he knew he was going to quit. So he didn't tell anybody that he wrote the letter. Maybe he told his wife, I don't know, but yeah. He didn't tell anybody else. That's why he typed it up. But um, the Yankees, well, when um, Bob Gibson got his first contract, he was with the um, Omaha Cardinals. The manager was Johnny Keene, and the general manager was a guy named Bill Burgess. Now, Bill Burgess got hired by the Yankees as a traveling secretary in 1964. So Keene had a pipeline. Now, it's never been proven that he knew that they were going to there was going to be an opening. But that, you know, the circumstances seem to indicate that, you know, and the quickness of the hire would indicate that the deal was done. Was set up long before. Long before the other World Series. <laughs> yeah. I, I know in um, both Gibson's second book, The Stranger to the Game, yeah. and the Kurt Flood autobiography, 
<laughs> both talked about what a racist Salihimus was. Yeah, if it wasn't, know. it wasn't uh, <clears throat> side eyes or anything. It, it, it was vicious. <clears throat> You're not getting playing time on my team. Yeah. You know, just awful. And so I just wonder how much of the early '60s players and the end of Musial's career were wrecked by Salihimus and why the Cardinals put up with that. Well, Fred Sy was the owner before yeah. Gussie. Yeah, but not in Salihimus' turn. He was late oh, 50s yeah. and early 60s. Yeah. Well, um, he was a player man. He, he, he was never got hired as a manager yeah. in the big leagues again, although he was a coach. So, yeah. um, but uh, actually, this first year, um, and Musial says, told this story later, that, uh, you know, Bush, I guess, told him, should we get rid of Hemus? And he said, oh, let's give him another chance. And something I think that Musial regretted, actually, because Hemus was the first manager to bench. Yeah. Musial. And then he gave him a little bit more play. <clears throat> then when Keane took over from uh, he must usually actually got more playing time than all these owners. So. Yeah, it's a, a fascinating time in the game because of everything that went on off the field as well as, as on the field. And, and I guess that still happens to some degree. But uh, I, I was fascinated by the racial aspect of it when I talked to these guys, how difficult it was for them to coexist with them in, in the game because of there's so much prejudice that, you know, by ownership and management and that kind of thing. Well, look, look at Tony Garusa. I mean, with the Cardinals. It's, uh, it's one bleached team under Tony Garusa. Well, yeah, you're probably right. Yeah. I don't know that how much control he had over the players that they signed or didn't sign. I don't know. But uh, it, you, you might it may be a valid point. That, but, that's, but that also reflects the trend downward in African Americans playing baseball. It would be interesting to look at La Russa's team, statistically racial makeup, and compare it to the major leagues as a whole. It might not seem so anomalous as it seems to us when we're comparing it to the 1960s, where in general, especially in the National League, there were that many more black players. Since we're mentioning books so, so along the way, I just have to throw in my favorite of all of them is Bill White's Uppity. Yeah. yeah. That's that's my favorite baseball autobiography of all. He's a very outspoken guy. Yeah. And he won the president of the National League. And I said to him, I thought someday you'd be commissioner of baseball. He said, hey, no way they would want a black guy as commissioner. That's you don't want that yeah. Well, and after after they they got rid of him, then they invited him back the next year to the meeting to to have a little banquet in his honor. And he said, yeah. "Forget about it." Yeah, he was not happy going at all. He didn't want to take the job, but Gibson and a couple of the black players said, "You've got to do it. You've got to take that job because of what what it meant to the to the black players in the game." But so he did it grudgingly. And I'm told he wasn't very good president either because he, he just wasn't very active with it. But you know, in name only, he, he had it. He really had never been a good league president. So, well, <laughs> 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 what's the <laughs> league president? <laughs> what do they do? <laughs> right. It's not to make sure the umpires are on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> were Gibson and White being paid properly or were they? Uh, well, I, I, I don't think there's any, I mean, there was no, uh, you know, Boyer had the biggest salary. He's been there the longest, and was the star player. None of them made a lot of money. But it's um, you know, it's seniority, not uh, not uh, performance, for, until you're you know, been in the league five or six years. So. Until until Kurt Flood, you know, challenged the so-called reserve clause, uh, there wasn't a lot of big money for those players. Mm -hmm. Relatively speaking, I mean, yeah, it's probably better than the guy delivering the mail. But they didn't make the big dollars until till that happened, until players were able to become free agents and, and flood paid the paid the ultimate price. And this is not part of this book, of course, but uh, I don't know how much longer he would have played anyway. He had been around a long time. But uh, I got to know him a little bit. I remember standing outside his apartment 
when he refused to go to Philadelphia for the trade. And he said, I'm a $90,000 slave. Uh, that's a strange way to put it. And a lot of people were outraged by that, by that comment, you know, because 90 grand in those days was a hell of a lot of money. But uh, he, he, he said Philadelphia is a violent racial city. And I, I, I live in a great city in St. Louis. I'm just not going to go. And uh, so he paid the price. He came back and tried to play a couple of years later, and there was, there was nothing left. Well, he's part of that story was, you know, he was famous for the paint for his painting and which yeah. stuff. That was phony. He didn't know it. He, he paid somebody to paint those portraits, you know. But anyway, long story for the day. But uh, Mickey Mantle's comment on the book. The book. Did you really write that? Write that? I didn't even read it. Anyway, let's ask for him again. When was that reserve clause? 68, 1966. The first free agency was 1975. And I think Clark Challenge was about 72, something like well, that. Well, the, the, the trade was after the 70 season. Yeah. So he he so laid the ground for yes, 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 Without uh, question, he did. I was, a, I was a really young guy trying to interview him in those days when he said, I'm a $90,000 slave. I bet. I don't think that's going to go over too well, but uh, I didn't. That was the 70s. Yeah. 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 Ron, where were you in 1964? Were you uh, working in St. Louis then? I was, uh, I won't go into great detail, but when I got out of college in the Army, I worked in public relations at the Auburn Club of Missouri, Triple A. And a very quick, quick story my career was a total accident. I was in public relations with the Auburn Club, and in September, we would go around visiting radio stations with a public service campaign, schools open drive safely. I was calling on a radio station at Belleville, WYBB. And the general manager said, you did some radio work, did you? And I said, well, I had one, but I'm a coach at college, this is a work. I was like a part-time job. I said, well, he's not tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, do it, I didn't do it tonight, but he won a lot of working weekends at the Belleville, WYBB, and five days a week in the hour club. And uh, I did it for a couple, a year and a half, and I, it was fun, but I, he was getting kind of old. But Bob Hardy, the great news guy in KMOX, lived over there, and he called me, and he said, I heard you, and we're looking for a part-time weekender at KMOX, would you be interested? And I was like, God, probably. And so I went on audition, cut an audition tape, and I made a weekend. So I'm back to seven days a week again. <clears throat> but it was KMOX, it wasn't Belleville. And that's how it all started. <laughs> he got to go a full-time job. So I stayed there about a year and a half, I guess. Did a little sports. Did some building and basketball with Jay Randolph. Jay left Cam Weiss to go to Channel 5. And Cam Weiss had so much talent there. I mean, they were the, oh, we had so much great. I wasn't getting anywhere. So I called Jay one night and said, Jay, if you're here, you let me know. It's a great radio station, one of the best in the country, but I'm not getting anywhere. If you hear them, they let me know. It's, oh my God, we're looking to hire another sports guy here at Channel 5. Would you be in? I said, Would I be interested? Well, of course. He said, uh, When you did come to an audition? He said, You tell me. And he said, uh, Come over at 10 30 tonight after the 10 o'clock news. And, and said, I'm uh, from the camera sports guy. So I did that. I did it the next day. I gave Bob Hyland, the general manager, came watch two weeks notice. He gave me 30 minutes to get out of the building. <laughs> Literally, I had somebody stand over his foot. I wouldn't take the Rolodex in sports cards because we all look at things. So that's how it all started. I'm going to be That's how it all started. All right. Well, we're going to close out the meeting here. Thank you all so much for coming. I do want to plug really quick if you do not have a St. Louis Coast library card or even if you already do, we have a Cardinals library card now. So if you already have a card, you can just say, I want a Cardinals card. And you can switch you to a Cardinals card really quick. Um, and uh, as Shane said, we have several more uh, left bank events coming up here in the next couple weeks. So we thank you guys so much for coming. Make sure you get a book. Thank you so much. Thank you.